All right, since this is the first night, I'm going to give you just a very brief introduction. And first of all, I do want to thank uh, Pastor Alter and the church for inviting me. And I thank you, church members, for coming out tonight, and especially some visitors that I've met. Uh, the hospitality and generosity that's been extended to me already since I've been here is much more than I deserve. Now, I have three lectures for you. Tonight, it's going to be the prehistory of the King James Bible. Tomorrow night, the Bishop's Bible and its relationship to the King James Bible. And then lecture three, the 1611 King James Bible and its editions. I hope you can make all three lectures. Lecture two will build on lecture one, and then lecture three will build on lecture one and two. Now, many things have been written down through the years about how the King James Bible has tremendously influenced English language and English literature. I'm not going to talk about that. There are books on that. Many things were written in the 20th century about why the King James Bible is superior to modern versions. And I believe that it is, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. There's all kinds of books on that. Much was written about the history of the King James Bible leading up to the 400th anniversary in 2011. There were a lot of new books that came out. But if you look at all the histories of the English Bible that have been written over the years, they naturally devote uh, much of their space to the history of the King James Bible. My focus, I believe, is unique. And that's because I've spent the last 25 years researching and writing on the history and text of the King James Bible based not on what people say in their books, but on my study of all the primary source material and then, of course, the secondary source material as well. So my focus is on the history of the King James Bible that you won't find in the typical Bible history book. And my focus is also different because it's from a Bible-believing perspective, not a critical perspective. Amen. Now, I've also written three books on the King James Bible, and they're out there on the book table. And I brought some of my other books as well. There are descriptions of the books on the back cover. And the books are also discounted, cheaper than you can buy them from my own website. Now, the lectures are based on primary sources what they are, and then what they tell us. And I invite you to stay after the lecture. That's just the first part of it tonight. Because I'll have on display in the other room over there facsimile editions and copies of old Bibles and manuscripts that relate to the history of the King James Bible. And that display will change each night depending on what I talk about. So I have three goals. Number one, I want to give you an understanding of the true history of the King James Bible. Number two, I want to correct misconceptions and misinformation about the history of the King James Bible. Some of it even from Bible believers. And then three, I want to help you to better appreciate the Bible you hold in your hands. All right, so let's get started. I'm excited. Now, Lecture 1 is going to cover King James and the Throne of England, the Church of England, the Hampton Court Conference, the Hebrew Bible, Erasmus of Rotterdam, the editions of the Greek New Testament, William Tyndale, the Tyndale New Testament, Miles Coverdale, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthew Bible, the Great Bible, the Whittingham New Testament, and the Geneva Bible. Notice, first of all, the wording on the title page of the first edition of the King James Bible. Newly translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special commandment. So here's the title page of the first edition of the King James Bible. The title's the Holy Bible, not the King James Version or the King James Bible. And I'll talk more about the title in a few minutes. I'll also talk about the images on the title page in Lecture 3. Now, notice the title includes the name of the printer, that's Robert Barker, and the date, 1611. 
But note especially three things. The original tongues, that be Greek and Hebrew. The former translations, that's the English translations before the King James Version. And then also His Majesty. And of course, that's King James. The King James Bible was equally a translation and a revision. You can't understand the history of the King James Bible without knowing something about the history of the Hebrew and Greek texts that underlie it, and especially the history of the early English Bibles that preceded it upon which it was based. But first, let's look at King James. He lived 1566 to 1625. He was crowned King James I of England in 1603. He was educated. He wrote several books. He was Protestant. And he was theologically minded. He was a firm believer in the divine right of kings and the Episcopal government of the Church of England. He had seven children, but only two lived to adulthood. His son Charles, who succeeded him, was executed in 1640. However, his daughter Elizabeth married a German prince and had 13 children. Her grandson, George I, became King of England in 1714, thus beginning the German Hanover control of the throne of England. The great-grandson of George I was George III, the English king during the American Revolution. But King James was also James VI of Scotland since 1567. He was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. He was from the Stuart dynasty. So how did he become the king of England? Here's the family tree of King James. The Tudor dynasty ruled England beginning with Henry VII. He was succeeded by the infamous Henry VIII. Henry uh, was succeeded by Edward VI, who died in 1553. Mary I, also called Bloody Mary, she died in 1558. And then Elizabeth I, she died in 1603. Now, all three of Henry's children died childless. Henry's sister, Margaret, had married James IV of Scotland. Her granddaughter was Mary, Queen of Scots, the mother of King James. But then by her second husband, her grandson, was Henry, the father of King James. So King James was the great-grandson of Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry VIII. His parents were half-cousins, sharing one grandmother. All right, here are two verses from the Bible on kings. And about the first verse, I want to say this. King James was not a saint, but he was also not a monster like Henry VIII. But as God used King Nebuchadnezzar and King Cyrus... So God used King James. God can use anyone. He used Moses the murderer. He used David the adulterer. God used Balaam's donkey. And you know what? God can use you if you'll let him. So the case for the King James Bible does not depend on King James himself. Now of the second verse, I want to say this. King James had no hand in translating the Bible. There's no record of him saying anything about the King James Bible after it was published. But his sanctioning of the translation that bears his name lent authority to it. For 200 years, it was referred to as King James's Bible. But it was also referred to as early as 1620 as the authorized version. So I will use interchangeably throughout these lectures, Authorized Version, King James Version, and King James Bible. All right, here's Henry VIII, 1491 to 1547. 
Why look at Henry VIII? He's the most important figure in English church history. You can't understand the history of the King James Bible without knowing a little of English church history. So, England, like most of Europe at this time, was a Catholic country. In 1521, the Pope titled Henry Defender of the Faith. The Protestant Reformation, though, was taking place in Europe. You had Luther in Germany, and you had Zwingli in Switzerland. But in England, in 1534, you had what was called the Act of Supremacy. This is when Henry VIII broke with the Pope, not over doctrine, but because he wanted a divorce from the first of his six wives. Now, in the Act of Supremacy, Parliament recognized Henry as the supreme head of the Church of England. And that relationship continues to this day. Queen Elizabeth is the head of the Church of England, or the Anglican Church. In the United States, it's called the Episcopal Church. Now, Episcopal refers to government by bishops. Let me say two important things about that. In the New Testament, bishop, pastor, elder all refer to the same office. There's nothing higher. Below is the office of a deacon. However, what you have in Protestant churches, not just the Church of England, but all Protestant churches, have a multitude of unscriptural offices, boards, and committees in their church government going all the way up to a denominational headquarters. The second thing I want to say about this is the union of church and state. This is one of the great evils of church history and one of the great heresies of Christianity. So the king should never be head of the church. This is always bad, no matter what the religion. A Baptist church state would be just as unscriptural as a Catholic church state. So the Reformation firmly takes hold in England in spite of Henry VIII. Now, let's return to King James. He was crowned in 1603. And soon after that, he had, he had a conference at Hampton Court Palace. And you can go visit that even today. This conference relates to the King James Bible. It occurred in January of 1604, over a period of three days. King James met with his advisors and his bishops. Some of these bishops later became translators. Church and state. Now, also in attendance were some Puritans. The Puritans wanted to purify and reform the Church of England to make it less Catholic. They wanted a more complete reformation and they objected to certain ceremonies. Now, the subject of the Hampton Court Conference was church reform. Not much became of this conference. However, on the second day, the Puritan named John Reynolds proposed a new translation of the Bible. The king liked the idea, and work began a few months later. Now, how do we know what transpired at the Hampton Court Conference? There survived letters about the conference and anonymous accounts of the conference. These are discussed in my book, King James, His Bible, and its translators. There is one main account of the Hampton Court Conference that I want to bring to your attention. And this was written by William Barlow. And it's the sum and substance of the conference at Hampton Court. Here's the title page. It's a 114-page book. Barlow was the dean of Chester Cathedral, and he later became a bishop. He was chosen as one of the King James translators. So this is the official account. Now, the second thing we want to notice about the wording on the King James title page, we've looked at the phrase, His Majesty, the second thing we want to notice is the reference to the original tongues. Now, here we have the preface to the uh, King James Bible, and there are two statements about the languages the Bible was orig originally written in, Hebrew and Greek. Now, I'll say more about this preface in Lecture 3, but for now... I've reproduced the two statements there that they made. 
And let me just say, first of all, thank God we have a Bible in English translated from Hebrew and Greek, so we don't have to learn Hebrew and Greek to read, interpret, and understand the Bible. Now, the first English Catholic Bible that was translated before the King James Bible was a translation of a translation. It was translated not from the original Hebrew and Greek, but from the Latin Vulgate, the official Bible of the Catholic Church that was first translated from Hebrew and Greek into Latin around 400 A.D. And I will say more about the Latin Vulgate and the first Catholic English translation in Lecture 2. For now, let's look at Hebrew. Here's a Hebrew manuscript. There are hundreds of Hebrew manuscripts that have been discovered. The text was preserved by Jews. The traditional text was called the Masoretic text after the Masoretes who copied and edited the text beginning in the 7th century. The recovery of the knowledge of Hebrew began after the invention of printing in the 15th century due to Christian interaction with Jewish scholars and the work of converted Jews. The scholarship of medieval rabbis was communicated to the world through independent Latin translations of the Old Testament made during the 16th century. They formed the link between rabbinic scholarship and those engaged in translating the Bible into the vernacular. All right, here's a page from a Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible was first printed... Remember, that's just the Old Testament. They didn't recognize the New Testament. First printed in 1488 at Socino, Italy. The first few Hebrew Bibles were printed by Jews. But then Daniel Bomberg, a Christian printer at Venice, published rabbinic Bibles. These were Hebrew Bibles with the text, plus notes, plus comments, of rabbis, plus the Targums, which are Aramaic paraphrases. And the first rabbinic Bible was published in 1516 to 1517, and it was edited by a converted Jew. And then the second rabbinic Bible was published in 1524 to 1525, and that was edited by Jacob ben Chaim, who later converted to Christianity and when he did that, all the Jews disowned him. All right, let's look at Greek. Here's a Greek manuscript. It's been identified as P52. There are thousands of Greek manuscripts that have been discovered. Few are of the entire New Testament. Many of complete books or sections of the New Testament. But many more are just fragments. Now, P52 is one of the oldest ever found. It contains seven lines from John's Gospel on the front and back. The conjecture date is the second century. The readings of Greek manuscripts make up the Greek New Testament. There have been three major editions of the Greek New Testament. Now, the recovery of the knowledge of Greek began during negotiations between the Eastern and Western Catholic Churches, between the Council of Lyons in 1274 and the Council of Florence in 1439, and also after the invention of printing and after the migration of Greek scholars and manuscripts to the West after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in the 15th century. So, Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza. Let's look, first of all, at Erasmus. He lived 1466 to 1536. He was a Dutch Renaissance humanist. He was a Catholic reformer, a social critic, a classical scholar, and one of the most prolific writers in history. The University of Toronto Press publishes his complete works, 89 large volumes. Now, Erasmus was an independent scholar. He was at home throughout all of Europe. He did study at the University of Paris. He began to learn Greek in 1501, and he started translating the works of ancient Greek authors. 
Then he received a Doctor of Divinity from the University of Turin in Italy in 1506. He lectured on Greek at Cambridge University in England from around 1511 to 1515. He harshly disputed with Martin Luther over predestination and free will. He was a harsh critic of the wars that plagued Europe and especially Christian participation in such wars. Now, the most important thing about Erasmus for us is that he was the editor of the first printed Greek New Testament. And here is a page from the 1516 Erasmus first edition Greek New Testament. It is in parallel columns with Erasmus' own Latin translation. Other editions followed in 1519, 1522, 1527, and 1535. The second edition of Erasmus was used by Martin Luther for the German New Testament. The third edition was used by William Tyndale for the English New Testament. The fourth edition added the Latin Vulgate in a third column. So Erasmus got the ball rolling, so to speak. By the end of the 16th century, there were about a hundred editions of the Greek New Testament. And most of the countries in Europe had the Bible in their own language. All right, then we have Robert Stephanus, 1503 to 1559. He was a French printer, scholar, editor, publisher, and bookseller. He was from a family of French printers. He resided in Paris. He was named the King's Printer in Hebrew and Latin in 1539 and the King's Printer in Greek in 1542. He printed Bibles and other scholarly material in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. He left France and settled in Geneva, Switzerland in 1550 because of conflicts with theological censors over his biblical publications, church and state. Now, in Geneva, he publicly identified as a Protestant. Here's a page from the 1550 Stephanus Greek New Testament. This is the most famous edition. Other editions were done in 1546 and 1549. And then after this, there was a fourth edition in 1551. Now, this last edition in 1551 was unique because it also contained the Latin Vulgate and the Latin translation of Erasmus in parallel columns with the Greek. And it was the first Greek New Testament to divide the chapters into verses. The 1551 fourth edition of Stephanus. All right, next we have Theodore Beza, 1519 to 1605. He was a disciple, associate, and successor of John Calvin in Geneva. He was a French Reformed theologian and a classical and biblical scholar. Here is a page from Beza's 1598 Greek New Testament. The fourth edition. It's the most famous edition. It was certainly used by the King James translators. The Greek text of the New Testament is in columns with the text of the Latin Vulgate and Beza's own Latin translation with annotations at the bottom of the page. Earlier major editions were done by Beza in 1565, 1582, and 1588. He also had minor editions in 1565, 1567, 1580, 1590, and 1604. And these editions had the Greek text with Beza's Latin translation in two columns. All right, here is a famous medal of Henry VIII. Now, during the 15th century, 
There was continuous interchange of scholars between England and the European continent, especially Italy. Trilingual colleges were established in Europe where Hebrew, Greek, and Latin could be studied. Instruction in Greek was established at Oxford in England by the late 1490s. Instruction in Hebrew began at Cambridge during the 1520s. In the preamble to a 1536 Act of Parliament, Henry VIII specified the three tongues as subjects suitable for a newly established public lecture named after the king. Regis professorships in Hebrew and Greek were also established by Henry VIII at Oxford and Cambridge beginning in 1540. Now I'll say more about Oxford and Cambridge universities in Lecture 3. In 1545, for the 10th anniversary of his becoming the head of the Church of England, Henry VIII struck a commemorative medal inscribed in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And this medal proclaimed him to be defender of the faith and under Christ, supreme head of the Church of England and Ireland. An Italian scholar who visited England in 1551 wrote that the rich caused their sons and daughters to learn Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. The cathedral church schools of Canterbury and York began to offer the three languages in the 1540s. Queen Elizabeth was reputed to know Hebrew, Greek, and Latin in addition to English and French. Now, the third thing we want to notice about the wording on the King James title page is the reference to the former translations. Here is an image of the rules drawn up for the King James translators. There's a list of 15 rules, and I'll say more about these rules in Lecture 3. But for now, I want you to notice two rules, Rule 1 and Rule 14. Rule 1, the ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. And then if you notice Rule 14, it mentions other versions beside the Bishop's Bible. So the King James Bible was based primarily on the Bishop's Bible, and then the earlier English Bibles of Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthew, the Great Bible, which was printed by Whitchurch, that's why it's called Whitchurch's Bible, and also the Geneva Bible. Now here's a statement from the King James Translator's preface about Bibles. There are actually four statements in the Translator's preface about the earlier English Bibles. This is the first one that you'll find if you read through the preface. And notice a couple things here. They say, a good one better. Well, that's a reference to the Bishop's Bible, Rule 1. And then they say, out of many good ones. Well, that's a reference to the English Bibles before the Bishop's Bible. That would be Rule 14. Now, in another place in their preface, the translators say that the worst translation of ours is far better than their authentic vulgar. And that is a reference to the Catholic Latin Vulgate. So let's begin with William Tyndale. William Tyndale lived 1494 to 1536. He is the father of the English Bible. He was educated at Oxford. He knew seven or eight languages. He preached. He worked as a tutor. He disputed with ignorant clergymen. He did some non-biblical translating. He had a famous encounter with a learned man in which he said, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow shall know more of the Scripture than thou dost. Tyndale said he was moved to translate the New Testament 
because of those who drive people from the knowledge of the Scripture. wonder who that was a reference to. Now, in London in 1523, Tyndale tried to get the Bishop of London. His name was Cuthbert Tunstall. Remember that name. It's going to come up later. He tried to get that bishop to aid him in his translation efforts, but he was denied. So Tyndale spent a year in London studying, and then he left England and never returned. He went to Germany. So here's a map of Germany. Tyndale left England for Germany in 1524. He is thought to have gone first to Hamburg in northern Germany. He did go to Cologne, Germany in 1525. And when he was there, he began to print the first English New Testament. He had to flee suddenly in the middle of the printing to avoid arrest by the Cologne authorities. He went down the Rhine River below Mainz to the city of Worms. And he started all over again. His complete New Testament was published at Worms in 1526. All right, here is an image of what's called Tyndale's Cologne Fragment. There is one copy of Tyndale's Cologne Fragment that is known to exist. It was not discovered until 1834. It is now in the British Library. It has no title page. It contains the prologue, 14 pages, a table of contents, and then the text of Matthew that ends abruptly at chapter 22, verse 12. That's as far as he got done on the printing. It has marginal notes and cross-references. All right, here is an image of the Tyndale 1526 New Testament title page. This is the New Testament that he actually finished and published in 1526. It is the first complete New Testament in English translated from the Greek. It was small in size. It was smuggled down the Rhine River into English ports. It was prohibited in England. There were public burnings. Bishop Tunstall bought up copies to burn them. Only three copies remain. One is incomplete. Another is missing the title page. It was bought by the British Library in 1994 for over one million pounds. However, a third complete copy was discovered in 1996. And that's why we can see this title page. It's from that third complete copy. It was discovered in Germany. 1996. All right, here is a page from Tyndale's 1526 New Testament. There's no prologue this time. There's no marginal notes. The New Testament ends with an epilogue of three pages and a list of printing errors, which is also three pages. All right, here's a map of Belgium. Tyndale resided in Antwerp in modern-day Belgium from 1528 to 1535. Belgium had succeeded from the Netherlands in 1830. Antwerp was a prosperous and cosmopolitan center of commerce, culture, and intellectual inquiry. While there, Tyndale wrote several books and worked on Bible translation. He translated the Pentateuch in 1530, the book of Jonah in 1531, and the books of Joshua through 2 Chronicles. However, those were never published. Tyndale then revised his New Testament in 1534 and slightly revised his New Testament again in 1535. Here is the title page of Tyndale's 1534 New Testament. It has his name on the title page, and it also says, Diligently Corrected. It was printed in Antwerp. It is superior to the 1526 first edition. 
This New Testament by Tyndale, 1534, is the basis of all future English New Testaments, including the King James Bible. All right, here's a page from Tyndale's 1534 New Testament. His New Testament contains two prefaces, marginal notes, and cross-references. It has prologues to most books of the New Testament. And it has an appendix with translation of 40 Old Testament passages. All right, here are the title pages of a couple Tyndale modern spelling editions that I want to bring to your attention. Exact but modern spelling editions of Tyndale's 1534 New Testament and portions of the Old Testament that he translated have been edited by Tyndale scholar David Daniel. He is author of the definitive biography of Tyndale, and he's the founder of the Tyndale Society. These were published by Yale University Press, the New Testament in 1989, and the Old Testament in 1992. It is interesting to read and note the phrases, sentences, and verses that read exactly like the King James Bible. All right, unfortunately, I need to tell you about the death of Tyndale. In 1535, he was betrayed by an Englishman named Henry Phillips. He was imprisoned in a castle in Belgium near Brussels for over a year. There is a letter of Tyndale that was discovered in the mid-1800s in which he requests warmer clothes, a lamp, a Hebrew Bible a Hebrew grammar, and a Hebrew dictionary. He was condemned as a heretic, he was strangled, and he was burned at the stake in 1536. His last words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Church and state, church and state. Now, we have a tremendous debt to William Tyndale, and he died for the most noble of causes. He didn't die in some senseless war somewhere halfway across the world. He died for the most noble of causes. Now, Tyndale influenced not just the English Bibles, but the English language. Here are some words introduced into the English language by Tyndale. And these are taken from his Bible and his other writings. Tyndale is actually second to Shakespeare as far as having an influence on the English language. Now, here are some biblical phrases first found in Tyndale. Many familiar phrases from the authorized version first appear in Tyndale. All right, let's move to Coverdale. Here's the title page of the Coverdale Bible, and the date would be 1535. The title page says, faithfully translated out of Dutch and Latin into English. Dutch was a reference there to German. There's also an alternate title page that just says, faithfully translated into English. There's a dedication to Henry VIII. It says in the dedication that it was translated out of five sundry interpreters. These have been identified as two German Bibles, two Latin Bibles, and the fifth referring to Tyndale. The title page shows Henry VIII distributing God's words and the gospel to the clergy and nobility. So who was Coverdale? Miles Coverdale, he lived 1488 to 1569. He was educated at Cambridge University. He was an English reformer. He is second to Tyndale in importance as it relates to the English Bible. His name will show up again in connection with three other Bibles. 
Now, he was not the scholar Tyndale was. He was not fluent in biblical languages. He lived in Europe from 1528 to 1535, and he was associated with Tyndale in Antwerp. Here's a page from the Coverdale First Edition 1535 Bible. It was printed in Europe and imported into England. I believe there are about 80 copies that are known to exist, all of them incomplete. In 1537, he issued a revised edition, and it was the first complete Bible printed in England. Now, the second printing of the 1537 edition had a license of the king. This was only one year after Tyndale was put to death. Coverdale relied on Tyndale's Pentateuch and the 1534 edition of Tyndale's New Testament. All right, after Coverdale, we have the Matthew Bible. And here is the 1537 Matthew Bible title page. It was printed in Europe and imported into England. It had a dedication to Henry VIII, and it received the license of the king. And you'll see that statement at the bottom of that title page. So, who was Matthew? Thomas Matthew was his name. Who was this? His real name is John Rogers, 1505 to 1555. Thomas Matthew was the pseudonym of John Rogers. Rogers was an English reformer, educated at Cambridge, he moved to Antwerp in 1534. He met with Tyndale and Coverdale. He returned to England in 1548 during the reign of Edward VI, the only son of Henry VIII. He was appointed lecturer in divinity at St. Paul's Cathedral. He became a popular preacher. He had 11 children. However, during the reign of Bloody Mary, he was arrested and imprisoned in 1554, he was condemned as a heretic, and he was burnt at the stake in 1555. He was the first one put to death under Bloody Mary. All right, here is a page from the Matthew Bible, 1537. The New Testament is based mostly on Tyndale, the 1534 Tyndale New Testament. The Old Testament was based on Tyndale's Pentateuch and Tyndale's unpublished translation of Joshua through 2 Chronicles. The rest of the Old Testament was based on Coverdale's Bible. On the last page of the Old Testament, the initials WT appear as an expression of John Rogers' indebtedness to Tyndale. Next we have the Great Bible. And here is the title page of the 1539 first edition Great Bible. It was called the Great Bible because of its large size. It was larger than the Bibles of Tyndale, Coverdale, and Matthew. However, it was smaller than the King James Bible. It was printed by Whitchurch, so it's also called the Whitchurch Bible, as we saw in the list of rules given to the translators. The title page contains an elaborate woodcut of Henry VIII giving copies of the Bible to Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cranmer. And then another image of Cromwell and Cranmer giving the Bible to the clergy and the nobility, church and state. All right, here's Thomas Cromwell, 1485 to 1540. He was Henry VIII's principal secretary and chief minister. He favored the English Reformation. He was condemned without trial and executed for treason and heresy in 1540. After Cromwell's fall from grace, his coat of arms on the title page of the Great Bible was removed leaving just a small blank circle. All right, here's Thomas Cranmer, 
1489-1556. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1533 to 1555. Now let me explain what that means. The Church of England was divided into two provinces with two archbishops. The northern province was at York, and the larger southern province was at Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury is the supreme archbishop and the leader of the Church of England. He has secular and spiritual duties and plays a role in coronations, church and state. Now, an archbishop is not scriptural. Christ is called the shepherd and bishop of our souls, 1 Peter 2.25. An archbishop would be above Christ. Christ is also called the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5.4. Now, Cramner did favor the English Reformation. During the reign of Bloody Mary, he was tried for treason and heresy and burned at the stake. The Great Bible was sometimes called Cramner's Bible because he wrote the preface that appeared in all editions but the first. All right, so here once again is the Great Bible title page, 1539. There were three more editions in 1540 and then three more editions in 1541. The fourth and sixth editions mention the role of two bishops in preparing the editions. One of them is Cuthbert Tunstall, who earlier had bought up copies of Tyndale's New Testament to burn them. The fourth and sixth edition title pages also say that they are the Bible in English of the largest and greatest volume, authorized and appointed by the commandment of our most redoubted prince and sovereign lord, King Henry VIII. References to the second royal injunctions of 1538. That's what that is. It's a reference to the second royal injunctions, which admonished the clergy to set up in their churches one book of the whole Bible of the largest volume in English. The Great Bible is the first authorized Bible in the sense that it was done under the auspices of the English church. Here is a page from the Great Bible, 1st edition, 1539. Now, although the title page says that the Great Bible was translated by the diligent study of diverse, excellent, learned men, it was primarily the work of Coverdale. But he revised not his own Bible, but the Matthew Bible. Also note that the order of books in the New Testament follows the traditional order first given by Erasmus in his Greek New Testament. That was followed by all future Bibles. The Tyndale Bible, Coverdale Bible, and Matthew Bibles follow Luther's order of New Testament books which ends the New Testament with Hebrews, James, Jude, and then Revelation. All right, let's go to Geneva. Here's a map of Geneva. Geneva was an important city to the Protestant Reformation. It was the center of Protestant thought and scholarship. The Geneva Bible was translated there. John Calvin was a pastor there. His followers are called Reformed. Many exiles from England settled there during the reign of the Catholic Bloody Mary, which was 1553 to 1558, including Miles Coverdale and John Knox. Knox was actually briefly the pastor of the English church in Geneva. All right, here is the International Monument to the Reformation. If you went to Geneva today, you would see this international monument to the Reformation. It's also called the Reformation Wall. It's on the grounds of the University of Geneva. It honors many of the main individuals, events, and documents of the Reformation. It was built to commemorate the 400th anniversary of Calvin's birth 
and the 350th anniversary of the founding of the University of Geneva, which was founded by Calvin. In the center of the wall, you have these four men, Theodore Beza, John Calvin, William Farrell, and John Knox. All right, in 1557 in Geneva, there's a New Testament that was translated by William Whittingham. And we want to look at this first before we look at the Geneva Bible. This is the ancestor of the Geneva Bible. Now, Whittingham, he lived 1524 to 1579. He was a Marian exile in Geneva. He was educated at Oxford and at French and German universities. He succeeded John Knox as pastor of the English church in Geneva. The title page says that the translation had been conferred diligently with the Greek and best approved translations. All English Bibles relied on previous English Bibles. Now, Whittingham's New Testament was based primarily on Tyndale's 1534 New Testament. Here is a page from Whittingham's New Testament, 1557. And there are four important things about this New Testament you should know. It's the first Bible printed in Roman type, so it's easier to read. It uses italics to represent words not found in the biblical languages, but required for clarity in English. The chapters are divided into verses, and each verse begins on a new line. So this is the ancestor of the Geneva Bible. Now let's look at the Geneva Bible. Here's the title page from the first edition, 1560. And the title page says that it was translated according to the Hebrew and Greek and conferred with the best translations in diverse languages. Again, all English Bibles relied on previous English Bibles. This Geneva Bible was the work of William Whittingham and at least five others, including Miles Coverdale who stayed in Geneva after the death of Bloody Mary in 1558. Now, Whittingham's New Testament was revised. It was not just joined to a new translation of the Old Testament. And unlike the Coverdale, Matthew, and Great Bibles, the Old Testament from Ezra to Malachi was now translated for the first time directly from Hebrew. There were about 140 printings and editions of the Geneva Bible. The last was in 1644. It was actually not printed in England until 1575 for the New Testament and 1576 for the entire Bible. Now, in 1576, the New Testament was revised by Lawrence Thompson and began to be used in many printings of the Geneva Bible beginning in 15. 87. Here is a page from the Geneva Bible, 1560 first edition. It has extensive introductions, notes, and annotations. King James did not like the notes in the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible followed the Whittingham New Testament in the use of Roman type, italics, verse division, and each verse beginning on a new line. It was very popular because of the notes, because of the print quality, and because of the cheapness in price. This was the Bible of Shakespeare. Now, the notes were so popular that between 1642 and 1715, eight editions of the King James Bible were published with the Geneva Notes. All right, here's a list of the material on display that I have for you. And notice, first of all, I have uh, a copy of Tyndale's Cologne Fragment. Remember, this only goes to Matthew 22. But when you look at that, you'll be able to see the first work by Tyndale that was ever done. 
Then we have a facsimile of Tyndale's New Testament 1526, a real nice facsimile that was done. And then I have the uh, Tyndale New Testament 1534, the modern spelling edition done by uh, Yale University Press. I also have the Tyndale Old Testament modern spelling edition by Yale University Press. And then I have a copy of the Coverdale Bible, 1535. I have a facsimile recently done of the Matthew Bible, 1537. Then I have a copy I've done of the Great Bible, 1539. I have a copy I've done of the Whittingham New Testament, 1557. And then I have a facsimile edition that was done recently of the 1560 first edition Geneva Bible. Now I also have a replica page of the Great Bible so you can see the actual size of how big it was. My copies that I've made are just regular 8.5 by 11 size. Now this material is intended to be looked through, not just looked at. So take your time, check the title page, check the preliminary pages, check the artwork, check the text pages, look up some verses and compare those verses with the King James Bible and see how they differ or see if they're exactly the same. The material can be looked at in any order. You don't have to start with Tyndale. Now finally, here are my three books on the King James Bible. And like I said, there are descriptions on the back of each book. So they're out there on the book table as well. So this concludes Lecture 1 on the prehistory of the King James Bible. All right. Thank you for coming, especially those of you who weren't here last night. This is Lecture 2. The Bishop's Bible and its relationship to the King James Bible. Now let's review briefly Lecture 1. We talked about King James, the Church of England, the Hampton Court Conference, the original tongues, which is the Hebrew and Greek text upon which the King James Bible was based. We looked at most of the former translations those are the earlier English Bibles upon which the King James Bible was also based. And we looked especially at the work and influence of William Tyndale. Now the main thing you need to remember from Lecture 1 is how the authorized version is both a translation and a revision. Lecture 2 covers the Bishop's Bible and its relationship to the King James Bible as well as other English Bibles before the King James Bible that are not listed in the rules given to the translators. Now, you may remember this from last night. This is the translator's rules manuscript. And I pointed out that there are two rules that relate to the Bishop's Bible. That would be Rule 1 and Rule 14. And here they are again. Now, some say the King James translators didn't follow the rules, and the King James Bible is not based on the Bishop's Bible. Well, they're wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. And I'll prove that tonight. Now, let's take a closer look at the Bishop's Bible. Here's the title page from the first edition, 1568. There's no dedication to Queen Elizabeth, but her image appears on the title page. There were 18 editions of the Bishop's Bible. The last one was 1602. Plus, there were many separate printings of just the New Testament. The second edition in 1569 had the Old Testament revised. The third edition, 1572, had the New Testament revised. Other editions have slight variations from each other. The 1572 edition has a parallel Psalter. It has the familiar text of Psalms from the Great Bible printed in parallel columns with the text of the Bishop's Bible. 
The great Bible Psalms were familiar because of their appearance in the Church of England's Book of Common Prayer, which is their order of liturgical worship that they followed in the church services. All later editions of the Bishop's Bible, except the 1585 edition, have the prayer book version of the Psalms substituted for the Bishop's Bible version of the Psalms instead of both versions in parallel columns. Now, the first edition of the Bishop's Bible begins with 46 pages of preliminary material, including an almanac, a lectionary, a calendar, a genealogy, and various tables. Most of this material is not found in later editions. However, there are three things I want to point out that are found in most later editions. The preface. There's a six-page preface to the Bishop's Bible, and then there's also a one-page preface to the New Testament. There's also a prologue. The first edition of the Bishop's Bible, and many editions afterward, included Cranmer's prologue from the Great Bible. And I talked about that last night. And then number three, the table of contents. And you'll notice the Bible is divided into five parts. Now, each of these parts had its own title page. In the center, you have the general title page. And then the second title page was Joshua through Job. Then you had a page for Psalms through Malachi. Then you had a title page for the Apocrypha. And then finally, a title page for the New Testament. So each section had its own title page and its own pagination. All right, here's the uh, first rules that were given to the bishops' translators and the King James translators. And the one on top is given to the bishops' Bible translators. The one on the bottom I've already pointed out to you. And... If you notice the phrase in the the first paragraph, which has to do with the bishop's translators, it says the common English translation used in the churches. That was the Great Bible. So the bishop's Bible was based on the Great Bible. But you should remember from yesterday that the Great Bible was based on the Matthew Bible, which was based on the Tyndale Bible. All English Bibles, up to and including the King James Bible, go ultimately back to Tyndale. All right, here is Matthew Parker, 1504 to 1575. He was the overseer of the Bishop's Bible. He was educated at Cambridge. He became a chaplain to Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife and then chaplain to Henry VIII. He became an administrator at Cambridge. He favored the Reformation. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1559 until his death. Parker wrote the preface to the Old and New Testament of the Bishop's Bible. He also translated Genesis, Exodus, Matthew, Mark, and 2 Corinthians through Hebrews. He assigned the rest of the biblical books mainly to bishops in the Church of England. Now, because of this, very early in its history, this was called the Bishop's Bible. It was the first translation by a large group of people. Most of the time, the initials of the translators were appended to the end of the book or books they translated. Now, we don't know if or to what extent Parker revised the translation of the bishops when they finished their individual translations. The completed Bible was authorized by the bishops, but it was never licensed by the queen. Now, previous to this, there were several failed attempts of the bishops of the Church of England to get together and translate the Bible. The details of all these attempts are explained in my book, The Making of the King James Bible. All right, here's a page from the Bishop's Bible, 1568, first edition. 
There are 57 lines per page. It's larger in size than the Great Bible. The text is in black letter with square brackets around words instead of italics to indicate that they are not actually found in the original languages. There are contents at the head of each chapter. Now, like the Geneva Bible, the chapters are divided into verses, and each verse begins on a new line. The first edition of the Bishop's Bible also contains over 100 engravings, portraits, and maps. And it has notes and references in the margins. Here are some phrases first found in the Bishop's Bible. Some of the very familiar phrases in the authorized version actually first appeared in the Bishop's Bible. So, the Bishop's Bible is the last of the early English versions mentioned in Rule 14. Now let's look at something interesting related to those versions. Pretty interesting, huh? That's a joke. You can, you can laugh at that. All right, first of all, we looked at Tyndale. Number two, we looked at Coverdale. Number three, we looked at the Matthew Bible. Number four, we looked at the Great Bible. Number five, we looked at the Geneva Bible. Number six, I just talked about the Bishop's Bible. And then there's one more Bible we're going to talk about tomorrow night, the King James Bible. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Amen. Probably just a coincidence, huh? Now, in Genesis chapter 1, here's something interesting. God said six times that the creation was good. But the seventh time, He said it was very good. The Bibles before the King James Bible were good, but the King James Bible is very good. Now, before looking at the relationship between the Bishop's Bible and the Authorized Version, there are five other English Bibles before the King James Bible that we need to look at. And here are the other English Bibles before the Authorized Version. So there were other English Bibles in circulation before the King James Bible, but they were not listed in Rule 14 that was given to the translators. Now, we've already looked at the Whittingham New Testament in Lecture 1 because of its intimate connection to the Geneva Bible. So that's why I don't have it listed here. We will now look at these other Bibles and then the relationship of the Bishop's Bible to the King James Bible. It should be apparent why these Bibles were not included in the list in Rule 14. Now, all of these Bibles but the Taverner Bible relate in some way to Latin. Until it was supplanted by English beginning after 1600, the language of religion, science, and scholarship for over 1,000 years was Latin. The Bible of the Roman Catholic Church during this time was the Latin Vulgate. And here are a couple pages from the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was a translation of the Bible into Latin by the biblical scholar Jerome around 400 A.D. It eventually supplanted the various Old Latin texts and became the official Bible of the Catholic Church. All Bibles were hand-copied until the invention of printing. And this is represented by the manuscript on the left, which is from the 12th century. Now, the first book of any importance printed using movable type was the Gutenberg Bible of 1455. And that was the first printed copy of the Latin Vulgate. Other printings followed. The Clementine Latin Vulgate of 1592, which was commissioned by Pope Clement VIII, was the official and authoritative printed Bible of the Catholic Church until 1979. 
The page on the right is from the Old Testament of that Latin Vulgate. Now, after the invention of printing, numerous other translations of the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin were undertaken by both Catholic and Protestant scholars. Now, let's look at the five other Bibles before the authorized version. Here's John Wycliffe. 1324 to 1384. He was an Oxford theologian, an administrator, and a reformer. He's called the Morning Star of the Reformation. He was a prolific writer. He was known outside of England, which is very unusual for that period of time. He criticized clergy privilege, church corruption, the papacy, and the mass. He advocated that people should have access to the Scripture in their own language, the vernacular. He was expelled from his position at Oxford. After his death, his writings were declared heretical. His books were burned. His body was dug up in 1428, and his bones were burned, and his ashes thrown into a river. Wycliffe is identified with the English translation of the Bible that bears his name but we just don't know how much he actively participated in the work. The translation was certainly done by men close to him and inspired by him. It is now almost certain that Nicholas Hertford and John Trevisa were two of the translators. Hertford's name appears on two manuscripts of the Wycliffe Bible. Trevisa is mentioned by the King James translators in their preface as translating the Bible into English. Wycliffe is not. The Constitutions of Oxford in 1407 forbid uh, anyone to translate any text of Scripture into English without permission or read any such writing composed in the time of Wycliffe or since without permission. These Constitutions were in force during the time of Tyndale. Now, here's a page from the Wycliffe Bible. Remember, printing did not begin in England until 1476. All Wycliffe Bibles were hand-copied. You have an early version beginning around 1382. It's very literal. The English follows the Latin syntax. Then you have a later version beginning around 1388. It has more simplified and polished English. There is no original manuscript of either of these. There are about 250 copies of the Wycliffe Bible manuscripts, and that's actually more than any other Middle English text. There are 20 whole Bibles. There are 90 complete New Testaments. There are some single books of the Bible. Now, the Wycliffe Bible was translated from Latin, not Greek and Hebrew. About 80% of the manuscripts are of the later version. There is also some variations in manuscripts. There's more variation in manuscripts of the early version than the later version. Some manuscripts are mixed with readings from the early and later Wycliffe Bibles. Some manuscripts are illuminated like here from the end of Luke and the beginning of John. Some manuscripts just had plain text. Remember, they're hand-copied, so they could be customized. Now, there are some phrases in the King James Bible that are supposedly from Wycliffe, and these come mainly through the earlier English versions. The New Testament of the later Wycliffe version was not actually printed until 1731. The New Testament of the early version was not printed until 1848. The first printing of both versions of the complete Bible was done in 1850. Now, here's a picture you should recognize from last night. This is Miles Coverdale. He was the translator of the Coverdale Bible, but he was also the reviser of the Great Bible, and he helped to translate the Geneva Bible. 
But what I want to tell you about tonight is he was also the translator of one other New Testament. All right, here are some title pages from the Coverdale Latin English Diglot New Testament. 1538 is when they were all published. Three editions. The New Testament appears in Latin and English in parallel columns. These images are not found in any book on the history of the English Bible. You saw it here first at Grace Baptist Church. Now here's a page from the third edition of the Coverdale Latin English Diglot. The Latin text is printed in the inside column in Roman type. The English text is printed in the outside column in black letter. The English text differs from the text in the Coverdale Bible. It more closely follows the Latin. There are no prologues or notes, just scripture references in the margin. All right, then we have the Taverner Bible. 1539, here's the title page. Richard Taverner, 1505 to 1575, was educated at Oxford and Cambridge. He studied law. He briefly served in Parliament and was a justice of the peace and a sheriff. But he did have a reputation as a competent Greek scholar. And here's a page from the Taverner 1539 Bible. It was a revision of Matthew's Bible. It had a dedication to Henry VIII, but it really had no direct influence on the King James Bible. All right, let's go to France. Now, find Paris and note the town of Douai up near the top of the map. And then note the town of Reims, which is northeast of Paris. The first English Catholic Bible is called the Douay Reims Bible. Here is the title page of the Reims New Testament, 1582. Now, in 1568, there was an English Catholic seminary founded in Douay, France. It was associated with the University of Douay. Many Englishmen had left England after the death of the Catholic Queen Mary and the accession to the throne of the Protestant Queen Elizabeth. Church and state. The English college moved to Reims, France from 1578 to 1593. The New Testament was published in 1582. It was translated out of the authentical Latin, which is a reference to the Latin Vulgate. The main translator was Gregory Martin, an Oxford-educated scholar. It contains a 22-page preface complaining about the Protestants, most shamefully in all their versions, Latin, English, and other tongues, corrupting both the letter and the sense by false translation, adding, detracting, altering, transposing, pointing, and all other guileful means. The King James translators mention the translation of the Reims New Testament in their preface. Now, the Reims New Testament is actually closer to the King James Bible than modern versions. It does not omit certain verses like most modern versions omit. Here's a page from the Reims 1582 New Testament. It's printed in Roman type. It has notes in the outer margins. The text is in paragraphs with verse numbers in the inner margins. It has annotations at the end of most chapters, pointing out supposed corruptions in Protestant translations and also notes defending Catholicism. Other editions appeared in 1600, 1621, 1633 and 1738. It was revised in 1749. Now, before looking at the companion Old Testament translation, we need to briefly look 
at a man named William Falk. He lived 1538 to 1589. He was a Protestant preacher and polemicist, educated at Cambridge. He studied law, became a professor at Cambridge, and then an administrator at Cambridge. He was the first Englishman during the Tudor period to write a formal attack on astrology. He wrote various anti-Catholic works. He strongly opposed Gregory Martin and the Reims New Testament. And here is his work known as the Confutation of the Reims New Testament. Here's the title page. His work was published in 1589, the year of his death. And what he did in this work is he replied to the numerous end-of-chapter annotations found in the Reims New Testament of 1582. This was a work of over 1,000 pages. It was dedicated to Queen Elizabeth... It has a long preface attacking the Roman Catholic Church. Other editions were published in 1601, 1617, and 1633. Now here is a page from his confutation of the Reims New Testament. The Reims New Testament appears in Roman type on the left side, and the Bishop's New Testament in italic type on the right side. After each parallel chapter are reproduced the annotations of the Reims and the confutations of folk. People became familiar with the Reims New Testament because of this work. His confutations alone were published separately in 1834 as confutation of the Remish Testament. All right, now we come to the Douay Old Testament. Here are the title pages, 1609 and 1610. Now, the Old Testament of the English Catholic Bible was translated after the New Testament, but it was not printed until 1609 and 1610, after the English college in France moved back to Douay from Reims. Again, the main translator was Gregory Martin. Volume 1 is Genesis through Job, put out in 1609. Volume 2 is Psalms through 2 Maccabees, plus the Catholic Apocrypha. That was 1610. Now, our Old Testament in our Bible ends at Malachi. The Apocrypha refers to other writings in the Bible that are not part of the canon of Scripture. All early English Bibles included the Apocrypha, but it was between the Old and New Testaments. The Catholic Latin Vulgate and the Catholic English Old Testament included books of the Apocrypha interspersed among the Old Testament books, plus Catholic Apocrypha that the Roman Catholics did not consider to be Scripture after the Old Testament. Now, the treatment of the Apocrypha by the King James translators was unique. And I have a whole chapter on this in my book, King James, His Bible, and its translators. Here's a page from the Douay Old Testament. Like the New Testament, it's printed in Roman type. It has notes in the outer margins. The text is in paragraphs with verse numbers in the inner margins. Unlike the New Testament, it only has annotations at the end of some chapters. It was reprinted in 1635, it was revised in 1750. It was not published in one volume with the Reims New Testament until 1764. Now we can return to the Bishop's Bible for the rest of the lecture. Here is the Bishop's Bible 1602 title page. The authorized version of 1611 was based on the last edition of the Bishop's Bible 
published in 1602. This is the official connecting link between the authorized version and the previous English versions. Now, there are six direct connections between the Bishop's Bible and the King James Bible. And here are the six direct connections. The translator's rules, Barker's bill, Samuel Ward's notebook, manuscript 98, the Bodley and Bishop's Bible, and internal evidence. So let's look at each one of these connections. All right, direct connection one is the translator's rules manuscript. You will remember that the Bishop's Bible is mentioned in Rule 1 and Rule 14. It is the basis of the King James Bible. All right. The second direct connection is Barker's Bill. Now, Robert Barker, he lived 1570 to 1645. He was the printer of the authorized version. He was the official king's printer. He was the son of Christopher Barker, who was Queen Elizabeth's official printer. Barker was plagued by financial difficulties and involved in litigation. He actually spent the last ten years of his life in debtor's prison. Through his descendants, the Barker name continued to be seen on Bibles until 1680. Now, Barker supplied 40 large church Bibles for the translators. We know this because he submitted a bill to the king, and the bill is dated May 10th, 1605. These church Bibles would have been copies of the 1602 Bishop's Bible. They were unbound sheets, and he charged the king 73 pounds, 6 shillings, and 8 pence. That's about $90 in today's money. All right, direct connection number three. Here's a picture of a man named Samuel Ward. He lived 1572 to 1643. He was the youngest of the King James translators. He was educated at and became a minister at Cambridge Colleges. He was a preacher, a scholar, and a moderate Puritan. He became one of King James's chaplains. Extant is his diary written during the years 1595 to 1599. It shows a man concerned about gluttony, pride, weariness in God's service, and inattention to sermons. Sounds like a diary of a Christian in 2016. Now, Ward was one of the translators of the Apocrypha. But something else he wrote is our third direct connection. And I also want to say that Ward's name will come up again in Lecture 3 in connection with two other things related to the King James Bible. All right, here is a picture of Sydney, not Ohio, but Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. Samuel Ward was made the master of Sidney Sussex College, Cambridge, in 1610. He's buried in the college chapel. Now, while doing research on Ward in the archives of the college in 2014, Jeffrey Allen Miller, assistant professor of English at Montclair University in New, in New Jersey, made a profound discovery about Ward that relates to the King James Bible. Here is Samuel Ward's notebook. Professor Miller discovered in the archives of Sydney Sussex College one of Samuel Ward's notebooks. It is 70 small pages. It contains the earliest known draft of any part of the King James Bible. For centuries, Ward's papers in the college lay uncatalogued. They were not cataloged until 1985. The notebook was cataloged as Manuscript Ward B, and it was described as a verse-by-verse -verse biblical commentary with Greek word studies and some Hebrew notes. Ward's notebook contains notes on the complete apocryphal book of 1 Esdras 
nine chapters. And that's the first book in the Apocrypha. And then also it has notes on two chapters of another apocryphal book called The Wisdom of Solomon. It has to be dated during the period from 1604 to 1608. Now, here's the format of it. You have a verse number followed by a quotation from the Bishop's Bible. Often just a word or phrase. And then you have an alternate English translation, sometimes with references to Greek and Hebrew. All right, here is direct connection number four. This is called Manuscript 98. It is a 208-page manuscript. It measures 8 by 13 inches. Each page contains four columns. The two inside columns are much larger than the two outside columns. Only the first two columns are used. The first small column contains marginal readings, Greek words, and scripture references, but it's not used very much. The second and larger column contains the King James translator's rough draft of the epistles, Romans through Jude. This is a proposed biblical text by the Westminster New Testament Company of Translators, at an early stage in the translation process. Now, I'll explain the Westminster Company in Lecture 3. So, the King James Bible was both a translation and a revision. What you have here are corrected verses from the Bishop's Bible that are written out in this manuscript. Manuscript 98 closely follows the syntax of the Bishop's Bible. Now, you'll notice there's some blank space. You have verse numbers with blank space, and that signifies verses in the Bishop's Bible that were to be left unchanged. Now, there are 2,782 verses in the epistles of the New Testament, Romans through Jude. There are 1,769 revised verses written out in manuscript 98. There are 1,013 verses to be left alone as they read in the Bishop's Bible. Now, of these 1,769 verses written out, all but 21 of them have some revision of the Bishop's Bible. 21 verses read exactly as the Bishop's Bible because they were mistakenly copied from a corrected bishop's Bible. Now, remember the 40 church Bibles that the translator, I mean that the printer provided to the translators. One or more of these were corrected by the translators, assigned the epistles, and the revised verses were written down in manuscript 98. Some of these readings made it to the final uh printing of the King James Bible in 1611. Some of them were further revised. Now, some verses have the first few words of a verse copied out, and then they abruptly stop. Several hands are apparent in Manuscript 98, aside from the original scribe. You have corrections of omissions, spelling, punctuation, and then corrections of corrections. Now, why is this called... Manuscript 98. Here is the Lambeth Palace. Manuscript 98 is a Lambeth Palace Library manuscript number. Lambeth Palace is in London near Parliament. It is the residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it has been since the 13th century. The palace also serves as a venue for Church of England events. It is home of the Lambeth Palace Library, which is the historic library and record office of the Archbishops of Canterbury, and the principal repository of the documentary history of the Church of England. Its collections have been freely available for research 
since 1610. Manuscript 98 was discovered in the 1950s where Archbishop Richard Bancroft had placed it in the 17th century. Edwin Willoughby first recognized its significance after being shown this manuscript during a trip to England in the 1950s. He mentions Manuscript 98 in his 1956 book, The Making of the King James Bible. Now, this is a small book. It's a rare book. It's not widely circulated. It's relatively unknown. The reason we know about Manuscript 98 is because of the work of a man named Ward Allen. And here is Ward Allen, my mentor. He's now 93 years old. He's a retired professor of English from Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. He is the author of three very scholarly books on the history and text of the King James Bible. He is the world's leading authority on the subject. He's also a competent Greek scholar. I've spent many hours at his home when he lived in Auburn discussing with him the history of the King James Bible and the translators. Dr. Allen read about Manuscript 98 in Edwin Willoughby's book, and then he spent years analyzing the manuscript. And here is Ward Allen's book on Manuscript 98. In 1977, he published the results of his analysis of Manuscript 98 along with a transcription of the manuscript. It's called Translating the New Testament Epistles, 1604 to 1611, a manuscript from King James's Westminster Company. Again, this is a rare book. It's not widely circulated. It's relatively unknown. We would not know anything about Manuscript 98 without Dr. Allen's pioneering and painstaking work. I have Dr. Allen's copy of Manuscript 98. All right, direct connection number five. This is called the Bodley and Bishop's Bible. The Bodley and Bishop's Bible is the only surviving copy of the 40 large church Bibles that the printer Robert Barker supplied to the King James translators. It is a 1602 Bishop's Bible with annotations made by the King James translators that indicate changes to be made to the Bishop's Bible. It was unbound when the translators worked on it. It was bound at some unknown point in history. And then it was unbound in order to photograph it later in the 20th century. It represents the work of the King James translators at a later stage than Manuscript 98. So what that means is there are more corrections in here that match the 1611 authorized version than you would find with Manuscript 98. It has annotations in the margin of the Old Testament found mainly in the books of Genesis through Song of Solomon and the Minor Prophets. The major prophets contain annotations only in the first four chapters of each book. No annotations appear in Lamentations or the Apocrypha. Annotations in the margin of the New Testament occur in the Synoptic Gospels, John chapters 17 through 21, but then only five scattered references in the epistles. The hand of three scribes in the New Testament is evident, and annotations appear to have been written at different times. Now, I will say more about the Bodley and Bishop's Bible in Lecture 3. But for now, let's answer the question, why is it called the Bodleian Bishop's Bible. Here's the Bodleian Library. This is the main research library of Oxford University. It was founded in 1602 by Thomas Bodley. It is one of the oldest libraries in Europe. 
It's the second largest library in the United Kingdom after the British Library. It is one of the most famous libraries in the world. It has over 12 million items, books, journals, newspapers, magazines, maps, and manuscripts. The Bodleian Bishop's Bible was purchased by the library in 1646, but its significance was unknown for centuries. It was first mentioned in a book in 1821. It was first listed in the Bodleian Library catalog in 1843. It is described in the second edition of the Annals of the Bodleian Library, published 1890, as, quote, a large Bible wherein is written down all the alterations of the last translation. Now, the Bodleian Bishop's Bible was mentioned in a few books in the 1950s. Ward Allen said that he read of the Bodleian Bishop's Bible in two of those books. After a series of articles about the Bodleian Bishop's Bible by Edward Jacobs in the 1970s, he assisted Dr. Allen in his analysis of the New Testament of the Bodleian Bishop's Bible. And here is Ward Allen's book on the Bodley and Bishop's Bible. It was published in 1995. It's called The Coming of the King James Gospels, a collation of the translator's work in progress. And then further work on the Bodley and Bishop's Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, was done by a man named David Norton. And here is a picture of David Norton. He's a retired English professor from the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. He's another mentor of mine. He writes books on English Bibles and the King James Bible for Cambridge University Press. He is second only to Ward Allen as the world's leading authority on the history and text of the King James Bible. Here he is in his office in New Zealand reading one of my books, the making of the King James Bible. He sent this to me as a joke. So, the making of the King James Bible is my book on the connection between the Bishop's Bible and the King James Bible. And I have it out on the book table. Now, here's Norton's book on the King James Bible, A Textual History of the King James Bible. It contains, among other things his research on the Bodleian Bishop's Bible. It was published by Cambridge University Press in 2005. Now, here's what I call the Three Stooges. This picture was taken in 2011 in Lexington, Kentucky, and it's the only time that the three of us were ever together in the same place. Now, we are three completely different individuals. I think you can pick out who's Ward Allen. He's 93 now. I think you can recognize me, so that leaves the tall guy as David Norton. So even though we're different individuals, we have something very significant in common. We have devoted the better part of our lives to researching, studying, and writing about the history and text of the King James Bible. All right, direct connection number six. And that is simply internal evidence. In the New Testament of the 1602 Bishop's Bible and the 1611 King James Bible, 2,102 out of 7,957 verses read exactly alike, except for some some uh, minor differences in spelling. That's 26.4%. Now, many of the verses that differ have only one simple change. 91% of the text is approximately the same. The chapter with the least number of changes is John 3. Only 10 verses out of the 36 verses in John 3 were changed in the King James Bible, from the Bishop's Bible. One place in Luke, you'll find 12 verses in a row that read exactly the same in the authorized version 
as they do in the 1602 Bishop's Bible. So those are the six direct connections between the Bishop's Bible and the authorized version. Now here is a list of all the facsimile editions and copies of Bibles and manuscripts that I have on display for you tonight. This is totally different than what we had last night. I have a copy I've put together of the Bishop's Bible, 16, 1568 first edition and 1602 last edition. I have a copy of Manuscript 98 that belonged to Ward Allen. This is the first rough draft of the King James translators on the epistles. I have for you a copy of the Bodleian Bishop's Bible. It's unbound. The pages are actual size. When you look at this, you are looking at it just as the King James translators looked at it. A 1602 Bishop's Bible page, and you can see where the translators crossed out words and wrote replacement words in the margin. I also have a copy I've put together of the Reims New Testament, 1582. And then I brought with me one volume of the uh, Douay Old Testament, 1609 volume, I think is the one I brought. I have a copy I've done of the Tabner Bible, 1539, that you can look at. I have uh, the third edition of the Coverdale Diglot from 1538. So I have a copy of that for you. Remember, it has the Latin and the English in parallel columns. And then I also have uh, one volume, I believe it's the New Testament volume, of the Wycliffe Bible, 1382 and 1388, and it's got both versions in parallel columns. And this was printed in 1850. And when you look at this, the column on the right, I believe, will be easier to read, even though it's still very difficult because it's such old English. But you'll see the difference between the left and right columns as far as the English. Now, I also have a replica page of the first edition Bishop's Bible, so you can actually see the original page size. Now, just as last night, this material is intended to be looked through not just looked at. I encourage you to check the title pages, check the preliminary pages, check the text pages. Look at the artwork, especially in that uh, first edition Bishop's Bible. Look up some verses in all of these versions and compare them with the King James Bible. Look up verses in the 1602 Bishop's Bible and see how close they are to the King James Bible. And again, you can look at all this material in any order. You don't have to start with the oldest. And finally, here are my three books on the King James Bible. And I want to mention especially the one in the middle, the making of the King James Bible. If you want to get more detail concerning what I've talked about tonight, the relation of the bishops to the King James, then that's the book you want to get. It actually includes a collation of the New Testament of the 1602 Bishop's Bible and the 1611 King James Bible. So this concludes Lecture 2 on the Bishop's Bible and its relationship to the King James Bible. Well, man, that was so interesting. How many of you heard some words that you don't know what they mean tonight? <laughs> All right, be sure and ask Dr. Vance. So you, you ought to write those down and ask Dr. Vance what they mean and see if he knows. I think that that would be a good idea. And I will guarantee you that he does. Um, it just It's just fantastic stuff. On that diglot, Laura's from Oklahoma, and she leaned over and said, I thought it was Diglett. And so I thought that was good. Um, it's just fascinating material. And again, this is information that you just can't get. There are several preachers here tonight, Brother Carpenter, Brother Stensis. You guys learned all of this in college, right? You heard every bit of it, right? Yeah, they're, they're both you know, laughing because it's just not covered. And it's really important that we get this. Why is this important? Why are we having this meeting? 
The Bible says that we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And the most important decision a person will ever make is whether or not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for their eternal life. You know, Dr. Vance preached Monday or Sunday morning about the exclusive claims of the Christian faith. The exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. Here's what Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's very important that we understand this. There's only one way to go to heaven. And the simple fact is all of us will either go to heaven or we'll go to hell. And it's based not on what God has done. It's not based on, you know, God chose some people for heaven and some people for hell. It's based on whether or not we receive the free gift of eternal life that Jesus Christ has offered us by believing on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans, it says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He mentioned how John chapter 3 is the same in the Bishop's Bible as it is in the King James Bible. And that is the chapter that says you must be born again. You must be born again. So here's my question. Are you born again? If you died today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? If you're not, you can. 1 John 5.13, it says, But these are written to you that believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might know that you have eternal life. Isn't it good that you can know? So if you're here tonight and you're not sure whether or not you're going to go to heaven when you die, man, just come to me. Pastor Nathan is in the back. Wave your hand. How many of you here would know how to tell someone how to go to heaven? Would you raise your hands? Man, if you don't know, find one of these people, and they'll tell you how you can know for sure that that you're going to heaven. Here's the thing that's so important. Man, we don't think we're any better than anybody else. We're just beggars who've shown other beggars where we found bread, and Jesus Christ is the bread of life. So if you don't know for sure that you're going to heaven, don't leave here tonight in that condition. Tonight could be the first day, the first day of your eternal life. What a blessing that would be. I'm so glad that you all came tonight. Let's all stand together. We're going to be dismissed. Don't forget to check out the display room back there. And um, I hope that you really enjoy it. Okay, remember the instruction from last night. Control your young. All right, those, those materials. Let me just say a couple of things. Um, Manuscript 98, this is material that no one ever sees. No one ever sees it. You get to see it tonight. Ward Allen gave his copy to Dr. Vance. This is material that you really need to see. And then that um, the Bodleian Bishop's Bible, the, the notes, he has it. You can actually look and hold a page. It's a copy of it, but it is an actual copy of what the King James translators would have held in their hands. And so it's really cool that you get to do that. All right, thank you for coming to the third and final lecture on the history of the King James Bible. And I want to thank the church and the pastor once again for having me in, feeding me, put me in a nice hotel, taking care of me. I really appreciate it. Now, let me review briefly what we covered in Lecture 1. We looked at King James, the Church of England, the Hampton Court Conference, the original tongues, the former translations, and we looked especially at the work and influence of William Tyndale. Now, the main thing you need to remember from Lecture 1 is how the authorized version is both a translation and a revision. Now, last night in Lecture 2, we looked at the Bishop's Bible. We looked at some lesser-known other English Bibles before the King James Bible. We looked at the relationship of the Bishop's Bible to the King James Bible. We looked especially at Manuscript 98 and the Bodleian Bishop's Bible. So the main thing you need to remember from Lecture 2 is how the authorized version is based primarily on the Bishop's Bible. 
All right, lecture three tonight, the 1611 King James Bible and its editions. This is going to cover the King James translators, the translation companies, John Boys and his notes, the making of the 1611 King James Bible, its title page, its preliminary material, its format, the King's printer editions, the Cambridge editions, and the Oxford editions. Now, let's begin with a letter of King James regarding the translators. After the Hampton Court Conference in January of 1604, a list of potential translators was submitted to King James. On July 22, 1604, the king wrote a letter mentioning that he had appointed 54 learned men as translators, and he also sought the assistance of other learned men in the kingdom. There was a tremendous revival of learning that preceded the translation of the King James Bible. The King James translators were indeed learned men, the greatest Hebrew and Greek scholars of their day. Translator Lancelot Andrews knew so many languages that it was said he could have served as an interpreter at the Tower of Babel. <laughs> Translator Miles Smith was called a walking library. Translator John Reynolds was called a living library, a third university, Oxford and Cambridge being the first two. Translator John Overall was said to have spent so much so many years lecturing in Latin, he found it troublesome to speak English in his sermons. Nine of the King James translators had served as Regis professors of Hebrew or Greek. Three had been Regis professors of divinity. All right, here are some statements made by the King James translators about themselves. There are three statements that are found in the translator's dedication to the king and also from their preface. These were the greatest scholars in the world, yet they were not full of themselves. Now, this is a, a page from the first biography of the King James translators. There have been several biographies of the translators written over the years, but the first attempt to provide some biographical information about the translators was written about 1650. There is a five-page manuscript in the Lambeth Palace Library. It was first noticed and mentioned in a book in 1905 with a transcription of just the first four pages. The fifth page was miscatalogued and thought lost until I obtained a copy of it some years ago and discovered that it went with the other four pages of the manuscript. Now, most recently, there is a biography of the King James translators called God's Secretaries, and this was written in 2003 by Adam Nicholson, and it was written to coincide with the 400th anniversary of the selection of the King James translators. It is still in print. I believe they have changed the title, but it is worth getting. All right, here is one of the manuscripts that lists the names of the translators. There are extant seven manuscript copies listing the King James translators, along with which of the six translation companies they worked on. There are 47 men listed. Some manuscripts list men by office instead of name. Some lists omit a name. Most of these manuscripts also include the list of the rules given to the translators. There are also other men who we know did have a part in the translation that are not listed here. Various names have been speculated over the years. All of the evidence is mentioned in my book, King James, His Bible, and Its Translators. Now, this manuscript tells us 
that the work of translation took place at Westminster, Oxford, and Cambridge. Let's look first of all at Westminster. Here is Westminster Abbey. This is the English National Church adjacent to the Palace of Westminster where Parliament meets. Now, an abbey is a Catholic monastery for monks. The origins of Westminster Abbey go back to the 10th century. Construction of the present church began in 1245. It is now a very large complex. Westminster Abbey was a monastery until the time of Henry VIII, who made it into a cathedral. And a, a cathedral is simply a church that contains the headquarters of a bishop. In 1560, Queen Elizabeth turned it into a church responsible directly to the sovereign, as it remains today, church and state. All the monarchs of England are crowned at Westminster Abbey. Over 3,000 of the most significant people in English history are buried or commemorated at Westminster Abbey. King James is buried there. All right, the second place translation took place was at Oxford University. It was founded in 1096. It is the oldest English university and the second oldest university in continuous existence. It is also one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Many of the King James translators went there. It is divided into self-governing colleges. Oxford University operates the largest university press in the world. The third place of translation was Cambridge University. It was founded in 1209. It is the second oldest English university and the fourth oldest university in continuous existence. It, too, is one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Many of the King James translators went there. Like Oxford, it is divided into self-governing colleges. And if you were here last night, you may recall that I mentioned Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge, when I talked about Samuel Ward. Cambridge University operates the world's oldest publishing house, and it is the second largest university press in the world. All right, here are the six translation companies. So this shows how the books of the Bible were divided up among the translation companies. Now, the second Westminster company would be the one responsible for Manuscript 98 that I mentioned in Lecture 2 and will mention today as well. Samuel Ward, whom I mentioned last night, was on the second Cambridge Company. All right, here is Richard Bancroft. He lived 1544 to 1610. He was the chief overseer of the King James Bible. He was educated at Cambridge. He attended the Hampton Court Conference as the Bishop of London. Then he became the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1604 until his death. He was also the Chancellor of Oxford University from 1608 until his death. He was a strong opponent of the Puritans. He never saw the completed King James Bible. He died at Lambeth Palace just before the Bible's publication. Now, before looking at the 1611 King James Bible itself, let's look at how the Bishop's Bible was transformed into it. So we want to look at the making of the King James Bible. Now, there are extant some original letters, documents, and manuscripts that relate in some way to the work of the King James translators. This would also include some statements in the translator's preface. I discuss all that are known in my book, King James, His Bible, and Its Translators. There are seven major pieces of evidence that I want to mention in this lecture that provide us with some insight 
as to how the translators transformed the 1602 Bishop's Bible into the 1611 authorized version. So what we're going to look at is the Translator's Rules Manuscript, the Synod of Dort, Samuel Ward's Notebook, Manuscript 98, the Bodley and Bishop's Bible, the biography of John Boys, and finally John Boys' Notes. All right, first of all, the making of the King James Bible, number one, would be the translator's rules manuscript. Now, I introduced the list of rules given to the translators in Lecture 1, and I revisited it in Lecture 2. There are extant seven manuscript copies of these rules. They differ slightly in wording and spelling. There were originally 14 rules. The 15th rule was added later, and it does not appear in all the manuscripts. Most manuscripts also include the list of the names of the translators and the company they served on. Now, Rule 1 and 14 we've already looked at. They relate to the King James Bible being based on the Bishop's Bible and the earlier English translations. Rule 2 through 4 relate to translation practice. Rules 5 through 7 relate to the format of the text and margins. Rules 8 through 12 relate to translation procedure. Rule 13 relates to translation company organization. And Rule 15 was meant to clarify the third and fourth rules. All right, here is uh, a representation of a meeting called the Synod of Dort which occurred in 1618 to 1619. This is the second piece of evidence in the making of the King James Bible. The Synod of Dort was a council of the Dutch Reformed Church held at Dortrecht or Dort in the Netherlands. It was designed to settle the theological controversy between the Calvinists and the Arminians. I discussed this synod in detail in my book, The Other Side of Calvinism. Foreign representatives also attended this meeting, including a delegation from England. King James translator Samuel Ward was in attendance representing the English church. The British delegation issued a report to the Synod of Dort about the translation of the King James Bible. The report paraphrased some of the original rules given to the translators and added some other guidelines relating to how to represent words in the text, not in the original languages, but necessary in English, chapter summaries, and the inclusion of a genealogy and map of the Holy Land. The report also supplies information about how the work was carried out that supplements the translator's rules and adds information about a general meeting of 12 translators for the final revision and how two translators put the finishing touches to the new Bible. Now, these rules are listed in my book, King James, His Bible and Its Translators. All right, here's Samuel Ward and his notebook that I introduced last night. This is the making of the King James Bible number three. The notebook contains Ward's notes on one complete book of the Bible and two chapters of another book. It has proposed revisions to the Bishop's Bible. It shows us a translator working individually on a particular book of the Bible. Now, were the translators in each company initially assigned their own biblical book? We don't know. All we know for certain is that Samuel Ward did do some translating on his own. All right, here is the Lambeth Palace and Manuscript 98 that I introduced last night. This is the making of the King James Bible number 4. Manuscript 98 is a proposed biblical text for Romans through Jude, 
made by the Westminster New Testament Company of Translators. It contains corrected verses from the Bishop's Bible written out with blank space signifying verses in the Bishop's Bible that were to be left unchanged. It shows the completed work on a first rough draft of the biblical books a translation company was assigned. It gives us a text that is approximately halfway between the 1602 Bishop's Bible and the 1611 King James Bible. Each biblical book, except 2nd and 3rd John, begins on a new page. This could be because it would allow for easy circulation of a particular biblical book to certain members of the translation company or other transla translation companies or even other scholars throughout the land for review. All right, here is the Bodleian Library and the Bodleian Bishop's Bible that I introduced in Lecture 2. This is the making of the King James Bible number 5. Now, the Bodleian Bishop's Bible is the only surviving copy of the 40 large church Bibles that the printer supplied to the translators. A 1602 Bishop's Bible with annotations made by the translators. And these indicate changes that were to be made to the Bishop's Bible. Now, the New Testament annotations record two stages of revision by the Oxford New Testament Company of Translators. This shows that the company went over its work a second time. The New Testament text is from about two-thirds to five-sixths complete. So what that means is two-thirds to five-sixths of the corrections made made it to the final 1611 King James Bible. The Old Testament annotations have no change of hand in the two places where the work of one translation company would have ceased and another began. So that would be between 2 Kings and 1 Chronicles and between Song of Solomon and Isaiah. So the Old Testament annotations represent the work at a single point in time, combining the work of the First Westminster, First Cambridge, and First Oxford companies. The Old Testament text is about five-sixths complete. All right, here is Anthony Walker's biography of John Boyce. This is the making of the King James Bible, number six. The most important translator of the King James Bible was John Boyes. He lived 1560 to 1643. He learned Hebrew and Greek during grammar school. He enrolled in St. John's College, Cambridge, when he was 14. He frequently worked in the college library from four in the morning until eight at night. He became a lecturer at St. John's College at age 22. He also gave private lectures on Greek from his bed at 4 a.m. He kept a diary. One volume survives from this diary written when he was age 66 to 78. Even in old age, he studied eight hours a day. He read 60 grammars of Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Syriac, and other languages. He had in his personal library copies of the writings of every ancient Greek author. He was as familiar with Latin, Greek, and Hebrew as he was with English. Now, the reason we know so much about John Boys is because of a biography written about him by a younger friend named Anthony Walker. Two manuscript copies of the biography survive. One manuscript was transcribed in a book in 1735. And the image you have on the screen is from that book. And if you're sitting close enough you'll see near the bottom there's a new article that starts, and it'll say something like the life of John Boyce. Now, Walker's biography is important, 
not only for the info it provides on John Boys, but because of the four paragraphs it contains that relate to Boys's work as one of the King James translators. It provides information about the making of the King James Bible that nothing else does. It also mentions the notes that John Boys alone took of the proceedings of the final meeting of 12 translators, which notes he kept till his dying day. All right, let's talk about those notes. John Boyes' notes. This is the making of the King James Bible, number 7. John Boyes served on the second Cambridge company that translated the Apocrypha. It was only recently discovered that Boyes had also been annotating a copy of the Apocrypha during the time he served as a translator. The notes he made at the final meeting of the translators consist of 39 pages on 498 items encompassing 480 verses in the Epistles and Revelation. They are written mainly in Latin, with some Greek and English as well. The notes show the Greek text being criticized and analyzed and alternative English translations being compared. It tells us more about how the translators thought than about how they did the fi their final revision work. We actually don't know the names of the other 11 men that were at this final meeting of the 12 translators. We, we have information maybe about two others, and that's it. Now, in my book, The uh, King James, His Bible, and Its Translators, I have a whole chapter on the John Boy's notes. All right, here is Ward Allen's book on John Boy's notes. Although scholars knew about John Boyes' notes because Anthony Walker mentioned them in his biography of Boyes, they were not discovered until the 1950s in the Bodleian Library by a man named Gustavus Payne. And he had written a biography of the King James translators that was published in 1959, the year after his death. Ward Allen read about the boy's notes in Payne's book while he was teaching at Auburn University in 1964. After getting a copy of the notes, he published a pre preliminary description in a journal article in 1966. And then in 1969, he published a transcription of the notes with an analysis in his book, Translating for King James, Notes Made by a Translator of King James's Bible. This was published by Vanderbilt University Press. We would not know anything about John Boyes' notes were it not for Dr. Allen's painstaking work. I have already mentioned his two other books in Lecture 2. Now, David Norton, whom I mentioned in Lecture 2, he discovered a second copy of John Boyes' notes in 1995 in the British Library. The name of John Boyes will come up again later in this lecture. So, the making of the King James Bible. There is only one 17th century description of the King James translators at work in what looks like their companies. It was written by historian and legal scholar John Selden. He died in 1654. He knew some of the translators. And here's what he said. That part of the Bible was given to him who was most excellent in such a tongue, Hebrew or Greek, and then the translators met together, and one read the translation, either a, the bishop's Bible or a proposed revision of it, while the rest of the translators held in their hands some Bible, either of the learned tongues or of some modern language. If they found any fault, they spoke. 
If not, he read on. Now, we know the work of the companies took about four years until 1608. This would include private review by individual translators, revision by the company, circulation among the other companies, more revision, review by other learned men, still more revision, and then the preparation of a final text by each location, Westminster, Oxford, and Cambridge. We know from Anthony Walker's biography of John Boyes that three copies of the whole Bible were sent to London to be reviewed at a general meeting of 12 translators. This occurred from 1609 to 1610. Two other men, one a bishop and one a translator, then added the dedication and the preface to the King James Bible. All right, here is the famous title page of the 1611 King James Bible. Now, as we know from the title page, the completed Bible was published in 1611. We don't know the exact date. We don't even know the month. The size was about 11 by 16. It was a large folio. What that means is a large sheet of paper turned lengthwise and folded once, which yields four printed pages on a sheet. Now, the Bible was not bound right away. The bound weight of the Bible was about 18 pounds. There were 1,464 pages. However, they were unnumbered. Now, this title page, it's a copper plate engraving. It has images of the Trinity at the top. You have a dove, a lamb, and then you have the divine name. You have the four gospel writers in the corners, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You have Moses holding his rod and the Ten Commandments on the left, and Aaron the high priest on the right. At the bottom, there's an image of a pelican feeding her blood to her young, representing Christ giving himself for the church. Now, there is also an alternate 1611 general title page. A few copies of the 1611 Bible have an alternate woodcut general title page that matches the 1611 New Testament title page. A second printing of the King James Bible was begun in 1611 and completed in 1613. Almost all copies have the general title page dated 1613 and a New Testament title page dated 1611. A handful have a general title page also dated 1611. Some of these Bibles have been found with altered dates on the general title page from 1613 to 1611 to make it seem like it was a first printing. Now, the first printing is called the He Bible. The second printing is called the She Bible. And those designations come from a variation in the reading in Ruth 3.15. One says he, one says she. Now, the second printing corrects most of the typos of the first printing, but it also introduces its own typos and spelling variations since it was printed from a new setting up of the type. The She Bible is a page-for-page -page reprint of the first edition He Bible, but some copies are made up of sheets from both printings. All right, let's look at the preliminary matter in the 1611 King James Bible. This is the dedication to the king. There were 34 pages of preliminaries in the AV 1611 after the title page. First is the dedication to King James. It's three pages long. It's written by Bishop Thomas Bilson. The text is in Roman type. 
it is still printed in some modern editions of the King James Bible. The dedication mentions the role of King James in apprehending that there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. And it calls King James the principal mover and author of the work. All right, next we have the translator's preface. It's called The Translators to the Reader. It was written by Miles Smith, who was also one of the final editors of the authorized version. It's 11 pages long. The text is in Roman type. It is a very learned address with Latin and Greek words and classical and biblical allusions. It is not reprinted in modern King James editions. Most people would not understand many things in it. Now, there are available annotated editions of this preface that explain the things that are in it. All right, then you have a calendar. This was a liturgical calendar noting the cycles of the sun and moon, important dates, and scripture readings for morning and evening prayers. This took up 12 pages. All right, next in the preliminaries was an almanac. It's an almanac of feast days for 39 years, beginning in 1603. It occupies one page. This was followed by an Easter table. This is simply a table to calculate the date of Easter for any given year. It was also one page. This was followed by a lectionary. This sets out the order in which the Psalms and other scripture passages are to be read. And it is five pages. Then you have the table of contents. Now, the numbers in the table of contents tell us how many chapters each book of the Bible has. The pages in the Bible are unnumbered, as I mentioned. Then you have the genealogies. John Speed obtained the right for ten years to insert into every copy of the 1611 Bible 40 extra pages of material consisting of a genealogy from Adam to Christ with a title page and a preface, a map, and a gazetteer. These are inserted after the regular preliminary material and before the book of Genesis. Several varieties of the title page to the genealogies were used, most of which contained the royal coat of arms. This was followed by a one-page preface to the 34 pages of genealogies. Then you have the gazetteer. It's a two-page gazetteer that begins on a right-hand page, and it's divided in half by a double-spread map. A gazetteer is simply a geographical dictionary or directory that's used with a map. All right, here is the map. The map is a map of Canaan or the land of Israel. It was reduced from a larger wall map. Here are both pages of the map, just like you would see it with the Bible open. The first page of the gazetteer from the previous slide is on the front side of the left-hand page. And then the second page of the gazetteer is on the reverse of the right-hand page. Two very similar editions of the map were used. All right, here are a couple pages, actually the first two pages, from the 1611 King James Bible. Now, the page on the left is actually a right-hand page, and then the page on the Right is what's on the back side of it, so it would be a left-hand page. Now, these pages have ruled margins with a text area of approximately 9 by 14. The text is in two columns. There are 59 lines per full column. 
The biblical text is in black letter with Roman type used for all of the other text on the page and words in the biblical text with no equivalent in the original languages. Now we would use italics for that. There are no apostrophes. There are no quotation marks. The letter I is used for both I and J, so there's no J in the Bible. The letters U and V are interchangeable. V is used at the beginning of words for both letters, and U is used elsewhere in words for both letters. The letter S in words, except a capital letter or except at the end of a word, is an old character called a long S that looks almost like an F. Now, the right-hand pages have the chapter number that begins on the page in the middle of the header. Left-hand pages have the name of the biblical book, except for the Psalms, which has the book title in the header on both pages. The subject matter of each page appears on both sides of the header. There's a catch word at the bottom of the right-hand column to indicate the first word on the next page. Each chapter begins with a summary of its contents. The first word in each chapter has a large ornamental initial capital letter, usually five lines high. The first chapter of each book has an even larger initial capital letter. Each verse begins on a new line preceded by the verse number. Now, in the margins, there are no notes, but there are 8,990 cross-references, 8,357 other annotations consisting of literal translations, alternate English renderings, and miscellaneous information. All right, here is the title page to the New Testament of the 1611 Authorized Version. It is a woodcut with the title, the four gospel writers, and the emblems of the Trinity, surrounded by the twelve apostles on the right and the tents of the twelve tribes of Israel on the left. The design matches the general title page of the 1602 Bishop's Bible. The authorized version had no other title pages like the original Bishop's Bible. Remember how it had five different title pages? The 1611 authorized version has the general title and then the New Testament title only. Now, according to a survey conducted a few years ago, there are only about 170 copies of the first edition 1611 King James Bible still in existence. Most of these are in libraries and museums. Let me tell you about a recent discovery. In 2015, that's just last year, at Drew University in New Jersey, they identified a first edition 1611 Bible on the rare bookshelves. It was in a box labeled Bible 1611 R. Barker. It was missing the title page. It was listed in a 1950 card catalog, but it was never put in the newer digital catalog. It was actually exhibited at the library in 1935 and 1977 and then completely forgotten about. So that was discovered last year. Now, the King's Printer issued four more large folio editions of the King James Bible. Here is the title page from the 1613 edition. The 1613 large folio edition differs from the later King's Printer editions in that the text has 72 lines to a page instead of the original 59 lines, thus reducing the total number of pages needed to print the Bible. All right, here's the 1617 King James Bible title page. 
This was another large folio edition. It reads page for page with the earlier and later King's printer editions, except the 1613. However, because the type had to be set up each time, there are minor variations in the text. Then we have the 1634. The 1634 large folio edition reads page for page with the earlier and later King's printer editions, except the 1613. Now again, because the type had to be set up each time, there are minor variations in the text. The name of printer John Bill now appears on the title page along with Robert Barker. And finally, we have the 1640. This is another large folio edition that reads page for page with the earlier King's Printer editions, except the 1613. Once again, because the type had to be set up each time, there are minor variations in the text. Now, in this edition, the letter J is now used. And the letters U and V are used in the modern sense. The name of printer John Bill again appears on the title page along with Robert Barker. The New Testament title page is actually dated 1639. Now, after 1611, the King's printer also issued many separate New Testaments of the authorized version and smaller sized Bibles printed in black letter or in Roman type. But it is actually the editions of the King James Bible printed by Cambridge University Press and Oxford that are the basis of our modern King James Bibles. Here is the title page from the Cambridge 1629 King James Bible. Of the four most important editions of the King James Bible after 1611, the first three were published by Cambridge University Press. The 1629 edition was the first King James Bible ever published by the Cambridge Press. It has the first systematic refinement of the King James Bible. Typos were corrected. The spelling was standardized, and italics and marginal notes were revised. There is no record of the men responsible for this. What you have to keep in mind is in the original 1611 Bible, the same word might be spelled two different ways in the same verse. All right, here is a page from that Cambridge 1629 Bible. The type is in Roman type. The letter J is used. The letters U and V are standardized. However, that alternate S character is still used. Apostrophes are just beginning to be used. The pages are numbered. Next, we have the Cambridge 1638 edition. This is the second major Cambridge edition of the King James Bible. You have a continued refinement of the King James Bible, especially the spelling being standardized and the use of italics made uniform. Original translators, John Boys and Samuel Ward, had a hand in preparing the text in this Bible. Here's a page from the Cambridge 1638. You have relatively modern type like the 1629 edition. The Old Testament, the Apocrypha, and the New Testament all have separate pagination. All right, then you have the Cambridge 1762 edition. This is the third major Cambridge edition of the King James Bible. It was edited by Francis Sawyer Paris. He was the master of Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. He had four degrees from there. He was the principal librarian of Cambridge University. He had worked on earlier Cambridge Bibles for the university press. 
What you have here is modernization and standardization of the text, punctuation, capitalization, spelling, italics, chapter summaries, running titles, and marginal references. And then you have more apostrophes added. Here is a page from the Cambridge 1762 edition. The type still uses that alternate S character. The pages are not numbered. However, there are dates added in the margins. It was issued in large folio and in a smaller size. All right, here is the Oxford King James edition, the first major Oxford edition, published in 1769, edited by Benjamin Blaney. He was a noted Hebrew scholar, writer, vice principal of Hertford College, Oxford. He had four degrees from Oxford. He became Regis Professor of Hebrew at Oxford. Now, Oxford began printing Bibles in 1675. In 1764, the Oxford Press ordered a collation of existing Bibles with the most authentic edition of the present translation. An attempt was made to eliminate all typos and further modernize and standardize the text. Blaney's edition did become the standard King James Bible. Blaney wrote a report of his revision work, and it was published in a popular magazine in 1769. Blaney's complete report is reprinted in my book, King James, His Bible, and Its Translators. Here is a page from the Oxford 1769 King James Bible. The type still uses that alternate S character. The pages are not numbered. There are dates in the margins. It was issued in large folio and in smaller size. The text and punctuation are basically like our King James Bibles today. Now, there are yet some special editions of the King James Bible published by Oxford and Cambridge that we need to look at. This is the title page of the Oxford 1833 edition of the King James Bible. Due to concern about the accuracy of the printing of the King James Bible, and also renewed interest in the original 1611 version, in 1833, Oxford University Press issued an exact reprint, typos and all, exact reprint, in Roman type of the 1611 Bible. It was issued in two volumes, Genesis through Song of Solomon and Isaiah through Revelation. This allowed people to easily see what the exact readings and spellings of words were in 1611. Copies of the 1611 Bible were rare, they were expensive, and the black letter type was difficult to read. So this was a great thing that Oxford did in 1833. Here is a page from that Oxford 1833 edition. Every page has the exact wording, spelling, and marginal references of the 1611 Bible, but in Roman type with italics used to represent words not in the original languages. It also contains all the preliminary matter in the 1611 Bible. And then it included a select collation of the editions of 1611 and 1613. Then you have the Cambridge 1909. Here's the title page. Now, 1909, that's pretty close to 1911. 1911 would have been the 300th anniversary of the publication of the authorized version. So as that date approached, Cambridge University Press published its own Roman-type edition of the 1611 Bible. It was issued in five volumes, three Old Testament, one Apocrypha, and one New Testament. 
Now, here's a couple pages from that Cambridge 1909. Each page in the original 1611 appears across two pages of the Cambridge 1909 edition. Each page in the Cambridge 1909 reproduces the text from one column of a 1611 page. Every page has the exact wording, spelling, and marginal references of the 1611 Bible, but in Roman type with italics. It contains no preliminary material except the dedication to the king and the translator's preface. All right, then you have the Oxford 1911, and here is an image of the uh, title page of the Oxford 1911 Roman type edition. In 1911, for the 300th anniversary of the authorized version, Oxford University Press republished the 1833 Roman type edition of the Bible with a lengthy introduction by a man named Alfred Pollard. This Bible was reprinted by at least two publishers in the 1980s and 1990s, and again for the 400th anniversary of the authorized version in 2011. Most people have no idea that these were reprinted from the Oxford 1911 edition. Neither do they have any idea that the Oxford 1911 was itself a reissue of the Oxford 1833 Roman type edition. Now, also in 1911, Oxford issued a reduced size facsimile of the Bible of 1611. So it wasn't reset in Roman type, it was an exact facsimile and it has the lengthy introduction by Alfred Pollard plus a transcription of historical documents relating to the making and printing of the English versions of the Bible up to and including the authorized version of 1611. Now, this introduction and documents were also published separately. Most modern facsimiles of the authorized version are printed from a copy of this volume, the 1911 reduced size facsimile of the authorized version done by Oxford University Press. Now, here is the title page of the Oxford 2011 400th edition of the authorized version. Cambridge University Press did not publish a special edition of the King James Bible for the 400th anniversary. However, Oxford University Press simply reissued the 1911 300th anniversary Roman type edition and called it the 400th anniversary edition. Now, there's also a uh, another attempt of putting the 1611 authorized version into Roman type. And that was undertaken in 1903, the, the Old Testament, and 1904, the New Testament. And that was included as part of the Tudor Translations, which is a 44-volume set of famous works translating during the, translated during the Tudor period of English history. And these were published from 1892 to 1909. So included in that range was the 1611 Bible printed in six volumes. And it was printed in Roman type. No italics, no marginal references, no verse numbers. The chapter headings were put in the margin. It contains no preliminary material except the dedication to the king and the translator's preface. Now, I brought everything but the kitchen sink tonight. I have a facsimile of the authorized version 1611, a really nicely done facsimile. 
Then I have some replica pages from the 1611 Bible. These are made to look like they're real pages. I have a title page and then a text page. But I also have for you an actual page from the 1611 Bible. It's 400 years old. Please do not let your children touch it. I would appreciate it. Then I have copies I've made of the 1629, 1638, 1762, Cambridge, King James Bibles. Then I brought one of the volumes of the 1909 Cambridge Roman type edition. Uh, the Oxford 1769, I have a copy I've done of that. And then I also have the 1833 original Roman type edition. I have a, a copy I've made of that, and it's two volumes in one. I have also a copy of the John Boy's Notes, 39 pages. Now, you're not going to be able to read them because they're mostly in Latin. So unless you know Latin, but you will be able to look at them and see the verses he's commenting on. You'll be able to make out where it says Romans, Corinthians, etc. Now, I also have on one table by itself... All uh, These are copies of all of the manuscripts that list the King James translators. And you can actually see the names of the translators as they're written down. And I also have copies of all the manuscripts listing the rules given to the translators. Now, these are all laid out on the table in a certain way, so you're not going to be able to pick them up. You're just going to be able to look at those. Most of these manuscripts are actually two pages, so you'll see how they're laid out when, when you go in the room. Now, I also have a volume from the 1903 Roman type 1611 Bible, and then I also have a 1611 facsimile of the New Testament She Bible. Now, once again, this material is designed to be looked through, except, of course, for the manuscripts. Check the title page, check the preliminary pages, check the text pages, look up the verses, compare it with your King James Bible. You can look at the things in any order. There's a lot more material in there than was in there the last couple nights. Now, here are my three books on the King James Bible. And if there's only one book that you get on the subject, you want to get King James, his Bible, and its translators. This is the second edition that I actually just published this year. So this concludes Lecture 3 on the King James 1611 Bible and its editions. I trust that these lectures have given you a greater knowledge of and appreciation for your Bible. I hope you appreciate it more, that you read it more, that you study it more, that you memorize it more, that you meditate on it more. Thank you, Pastor. Let's give him a hand.